So I'm Jason, I'm with Globescan. For those of you that don't know us, we're an insights and advisory consultancy focusing on sustainability, consumer engagement and behavior, and a lot of stakeholder engagement and collaboration. We work with large companies to a large extent, a lot of the brands and names you would know, and then also some NGOs and that. And we are probably best known for the Sustainability Leaders Survey, which goes back about 30 years or so, and it's a review of the top companies' sustainability, and it gives kind of the reasons and trends for that. So if you've seen us, that might be one of the places where you have. So I'm going to talk uh, today, share with you our latest uh, research, which is really fresh from the last couple of months this summer, on what consumers are thinking when it comes to sustainability and certifications across a number of different issue areas. So just to give you a little more background on where this comes from, it comes from three pieces of research that we do. So the Healthy and Sustainable Living Study, which is the primary one. This is a study across 30 different country markets that looks at consumer behavior, attitudes, behaviors, um, how they're looking at sustainability and healthy lifestyles, um, and kind of what it takes to reach them and move and change those behaviors. Then there's the work that we've done here with the, with the Cradle to Cradle Product Innovation Institute, where we've been specifically looking at consumer views of the certification and the market in four countries, the US, UK, France, and Germany. So we'll pull in a little bit of those insights. And then the last one is what was mentioned in the intro for our Climate and Nature Nexus program, which is really where we're working with a large number of companies in this very sort of hot and rapidly evolving nature and biodiversity space to figure out how they can take more integrated approaches and be more, more effective. So the data that I'll show you um, comes from, this is from the Healthy and Sustainable Living um, Survey, and it comes from these 30 countries um, around the world, so there's pretty good representation. It's a sample of about 1,000 consumers, representative po population sample, consumers, public opinion across all of these countries with a few exceptions where there's a few more people in the US and a few, more, a few less people in just a couple of markets where it's harder to get responses. In terms of the data, we're starting out with sort of what's the big picture in terms of what are the issues that, that the public and consumers are most concerned about, the environmental, social, economic, and human rights issues around the world. And this is what we find. So you can see war and conflict is at the top in terms of serious issues for people across all the countries that we looked at. But then right after that are a whole host of environmental issues with climate change and a number of nature-related issues, uh, with pollution essentially being at the, at the top of that list, along with the loss and degradation of natural resources. And then you can see how this layers in and other aspects of it. And then poverty, human rights, other social issues are up there, but I think it's interesting to see how prominent these environmental issues are. One thing to keep in mind with this, though, is that this is a population sample. So, of course, some of these that are further down are very acute and very serious issues, um, but this is responses that are given from everybody who's taking it. So that tends to mean certain things tend to gravitate a little bit more towards the top that aren't maybe necessarily as severe for some people as other ones. So just to keep that kind of context in mind as we're looking at this. So what does this look like regionally? So you can see that there's a number of generally consistent, but there's also some interesting differences across regions. So if we look at the three middle regions, four of the top five issues, like we would have expected from the other one, are all environmental issues. And then it gets a little bit more mixed when we look at North America and Africa and the Middle East. The one environmental issue I think that's interestingly common across all these regions, you'll see if you follow it across in the light yellow, is water pollution. So that's the one that's common across all of them. In fact, it's the only environmental issue that, that falls into the top five for Africa and the Middle East, which I think is an interesting uh, finding. And in the other cases, you see more of a rep broader representation of the different environmental issues that are here. Let's see. It's interesting that for Asia, too, climate change is really at the top. But for the other regions, there's sort of more of a balance and other nature-related issues tend to relate, actually come up a little bit higher than the climate change piece. You know, when it comes to the cradle to cradle cert certification, what we're talking about, I know one of the primary areas of interest, right, and what we've seen from consumers is this very strong interest, levels of concern around waste reduction, pollution, um, you know, what ties into and feeds sort of the need for the circular economy. This is also something just to fill in a little bit of context. So we did another program last year, which was on the nature agenda and looked at what do experts and consumers view as the most prominent drivers of the loss of nature and biodiversity. And if you look at that for stakeholders, the expert stakeholders, they pretty much track by what the scientific drivers are, with the loss of deforestation and land use being the top driver and then kind of going down from there. If you look at it for consumers, it's similar, but the waste and pollution, which is, again, one of the top five drivers, but it's significantly higher 
than the other ones and higher in the actual order of those. So I think it just gets to what we see through here in the theme is what you might expect for, for the public and consumers. It's issues that really hit home and direct them most effectively and they see most immediately in their, their kind of everyday lives. So I think that's a good piece of context and just sort of way of looking at this. And this one in particular talks about, we see from 65 to 80% across all of these regions of people want companies, feel like companies should not be using plastic in their products or want them to significantly reduce it because they recognize very strongly it's not good for the environment. They also see the, the light blue, you'll see that nearly a similar share, except for North America, which tends to be a little bit different, also recognize that it's a real health risk, right? So they see this as, it's bad for the environment, it's bad for the health, I understand that I want us to sort of figure this out and come up with a better solution going forward. So if these are the issues that we've seen, that people see as most concerning, then what do they see as the solutions to those, right? And so we ask them, and this is the list of issues that the public and the consumers that we talk to see as having the most impact in terms of protecting the natural environment, with that being, as you can see, air, climate, nature, water, wildlife. And you can see the ones that come to the top, and again, not surprisingly, they, they tie in closely to that whole issue of waste, pollution, reduction, having less impact on the earth and having and being very aware of those issues that are most directly related to people and that they see most in their own own environment. And then as you go down, you start to see other pieces with the buy environmentally friendly products and then sort of more the behaviors and that that are just better for the environment when it comes to transportation, walking, so forth. I think one of the interesting things here, though, is the buy secondhand and used items is directly at the bottom, which doesn't really make sense because we know that should be right at the top with the reduce, reuse, recycle, because it's a fundamental part or kind of basically approach of the circular economy and and in that approach. So it's interesting that consumers in a lot of cases don't make the connection there. And I think there's a lot of room to really work on that area. There is some variation across markets though where we see there is more of a consciousness and recognition of this in certain markets in Europe with Germany and France, I think being two of them than, than other areas. So there also are differences to be aware of here. We've seen the, the issues, right? The issues that matter most to people. And then we've seen what they see, think are the solutions that are gonna have the most impact. So how does that translate into their actual interest in brands and products and purchase behavior. So we talk to, to consumers around the world in these markets, we see that generally about 50, 40 to 50% say that they would like to buy sustainable, environmentally friendly products or try, try to buy all or most of the time which is a pretty good share of the, the market and demand out there. And you can see there's, there's a little variation, but it's, it's fairly consistent and there's a fairly big market out there and people want help with you know, being able to buy more sustainable products. They want help and people want to do it, but then what actually happens in practice? Um, and this goes a little bit broader than that because it's also not just buying products, but generally adopting more sustainable behaviors and lifestyles. But you can see that around 60% want to change their lifestyle a great deal so that it's more environmentally friendly and healthy with all the behaviors and activities and things that go along with that. But only 30% or actually 25-ish to 30% have say they've actually been able to make changes, major changes over the last four years or so. So there's clearly what we call a say-do gap between what people say they do and what they want to do and what they actually do and are able to follow through on. But interestingly, 87%, so the vast majority of people do want help with living healthier and sustainable lives. And they want that from companies and they want that from even their governments. They want that from the institutions that they see as being the biggest actors that are responsible for driving and the impacts that they have and then leading us out of sort of into a better space when it comes to the environment and nature and so forth. We just talked about kind of that, that say to you gap. What does that actually look like or how does it break down in practice, right? So in this case, we've just taken kind of a high level view of, you know, would, are you interested in buying more environmentally friendly products? Sure, probably everybody's gonna say that, right? Which they virtually do, it's about 90%. But we tried to break down what are the things that get in the way of that, right? And you can kind of see the barriers as you go across to the right. One is, do they have the information that they need to understand whether a product is really environmentally friendly or more sustainable or not? Then, uh, and do they believe that? Does that work for them? Are they, are they gonna buy into that? Then is the value there? If so, is it worth the price and are they willing to spend the money on it? Then as we go across, they are and they meet both of those conditions, can they find the products? And then finally, can they afford them? So you start to see how it makes a little bit, it's a little bit easier to see the say do gap because there's a lot of hurdles we have to get through in order to help people to actually be able to 
follow through on their actions and adopt sustainable behavior. And you can see the bar is actually higher for a couple of, of them. Um, as we go across here. People want to buy more sustainable products. They want more help with figuring out how to do it. And part of that is sort of under helping them understand, you know, what is a sustainable product? Where do I find it? How do I believe it's sustainable and trust it and so forth? So a key part of that is environmental communications, right? How are we, how are companies and other entities going out and communicating and trying to convince people that their, their products and so forth are more sustainable? And you can see here, it's interesting that there's really quite a high level of trust in the communications that are out there for consumers kind of across all of the categories, the product categories that are listed here. So that's good news, I think, if you're trying to communicate, because even though you know, what we hear out there is all the, the pushback and, and stakeholder pushback and greenwashing that's leading to greenwashing and so forth, there's a big difference between where stakeholders and experts and critics and advocates are out of these issues and where consumers and the people that are actually looking to buy products and go to the market and so forth are out on this. But at the same time, there are significant headwinds that you can see here. So there are significant drops in that level of trust across a number of these categories from 4 to 6% or so, which is pretty sizable for a change in just a matter of a year. So there's a sort of good story and an opportunity here, but there's also a story that, yes, this is a challenging area that people are starting to, where people are starting to ask more questions and want more sort of help with figuring out. How do consumers, what do they look for? right, to figure out if the product is more consumer. When it comes to the types of communications, which we just talked about, which communications, what content, and so forth, are most convincing and helpful, and interestingly, and what I think speaks very well to Cradle to Cradle Product, product Innovation Institute and the initiative and work that's being done here, and the value is that certifications and labels are really at the top of the list of how consumers say that they identify um, a more environmentally friendly product and have trust in that. The ones that follow here are the materials, ingredients of the product, what it's made, made of, which I think is sort of intuitive and makes sense. And then again, that close tie-in that we've already seen to the waste reduction and the idea of the direct impacts on the natural environment and the need for a more circular economy in terms of recycled materials and so forth. And those really stand out as the top, top three here in terms of what reasons consumers are, are looking at and seeing. This comes specifically from our study that we've done with the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute in terms of what are the spe more specific attributes of sustainability from an environmental and social side and so forth where consumers see the most value or want to see a certification most. And we've shown these um, on the left. This is for, again, the three categories listed at the top for clothing and apparel, for cleaning products, and then for personal care and products. And you can see number one across those three categories is the safety of the materials and chemicals. So that's the area where consumers see it's most important to actually have a third-party verification to let me know that this product is really better for those attributes. And that's followed by these flip-flop between two and three, but again, the again circular economy and uh, waste reduction tie-in to the fact that the product is recyclable, reusable, or can be prepared repaired and that the product has um, less of an impact on nature. Interestingly, climate change, which is kind of makes sense given what we've seen the follow through, but is actually below those other categories in terms of the level of certification, level of verification that consumers feel they need or want to see. And then working, working conditions and rights and that are at the bottom. Fortunately, I mean, this has been, I used to work for Gap, the clothing company, and so this has been a long-standing issue for a long time. It's very hard to get this value you know, communicated to get people to understand it. So this is a lot more complicated, you know, topic that I think deserves sort of its own attention. But anyway, this is how we've seen it break down um, in the study that we've done. We would expect to see what we see on this slide, essentially. Consumers are looking for more ways to uh, signals, trustworthy and credible signals of, a environmentally, of an environmentally friendly and sustainable product. They go, to, they go to certifications for that first. So this slide essentially shows you the increase in demand from consumers for independent verification or certification for products across the categories that we've looked at. And you can see that it's a pretty big, there's a pretty sizable increase. This data is actually 2017 to 2021. Anyway, the numbers range, they're all positive here. And there's a couple significant, you can see 9% increase in the UK, 9% increase in India, 9% increase in the UA, and eight in Canada. So there's really been quite a big, quite a big increase here. The last one, you know, we've seen Climate and nature-related issues um, with the tie-in to the circular economy are really at the top of the list of people's concerns when it comes to global issue areas. Those, the areas that we see as, as solutions, really in particular, are reducing waste, sustainable products, and the circular economy. 
the same time, we face this really, really real and difficult to, to address, say, do gap. And we need to help in that way. Companies and the people that, that help to communicate and work with consumers need to help in whatever way we can there. There's a lot of opportunity. And that there's an interest in people will are looking for information, environmental information. They're looking for things that they can trust and learn from. And they also, the bar is, there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of more upside than downside there, I guess we would basically say from a consumer perspective. And the good story, I think, here is that certifications have a very important role to play in helping to bridge that gap and helping people to understand really what is better for the environment and helping them to follow through on their actions and live and kind of adopt the healthier and sustainable lifestyles that they, they would like to. I'm curious what you think, because your data shows so much um, trust in brands themselves in providing the information, and if you also feel on the flip side that it creates the ability to uh, greenwash a lot and um, and what you've seen, uh, the impact of the, the communication to really clean up what might be going on or kind of push things under the radar of things that might not be as uh, savory. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's definitely two-sided, right? So it definitely is, I mean, I think it gives a lot of opportunity to companies, brands, in terms of communicating, because there is relatively high levels of trust, and the bar that a lot of consumers and that will set for it is not that high, not necessarily great for sustainability overall, but that's, that's what we see. But it does open the door to greenwashing, certainly. It makes it very tempting to just go put those claims out there and say, well, we have more to gain than lose, and you know, we'll take a chance on being caught out on it and so forth, right? So I think that's definitely true. I think the good thing is that, as we've seen with the legislation, as we've seen with the stakeholder activity and interest, that, that there is a lot more attention being paid to this, and there's a lot, this is, space is getting a lot more difficult to do that, which I think is following through to consumers, which we saw in that, that drop down in the trust. So I think it's just a part of being smart in terms of how you do it, and the certification, I think, is one of the better ways of doing that, because it does have that independent and third-party verification. I think that's why we see more of the movement um, heading in that direction as well. And of course, we would only recommend, when it comes to these data in terms of using it, that it would be fully backed up by the underlying good practices, right, when it comes to a company. We would definitely not recommend communicating if you don't have the actual substance of your programs and the actual impacts, and those don't actually lever up to the claims, because that's not a good long-run solution. Um, there's a big generational gap, probably, between the answers. Um, I'm coming from an FMCG company, and we're selling green cleaning products, and we just did a market research for the Generation Z, and it was kind of um, surprising the results. So are you seeing similar gaps in, in what you're doing in research between the generations in different countries? Yeah, so I think the general trend that we would see is the, is the younger consumers are generally more engaged and, and interested in this. But to be honest with you, I don't have a lot of the, the breakdown right off the top of my head, so I don't really want to tell you too much. It's some of the, in terms of the, the bar, in terms of how critical people some of those are and what they look for, I think can be a difference too. And I think some of the younger ones can actually set a higher bar for that and that it's actually can be a little bit lower in that sort of in-between gap area. So there's a lot of different certification types that have different levels of rigor, different, you know, some are multi-attribute, like cradle to cradle versus singular attribute. Uh, do you have any insights about how consumers are, per have you know, perceiving these different certifications and is there a difference in recognition from consumers that, that you're seeing? We do studies on other certifications. Um, there's generally, you know, there's also a lot of branding that's behind this, right, and how well the brand is developed and things like that. So some of these are fair trade and some of the ones that have been around for a long time and had a lot of marketing are kind of in a little bit different category for some of these things. But we did test for that here because we were wondering what the difference is between if it's a multi-certification and, you know, does that dilute it or what does that change versus focusing in particular in one area. And there is a preference for, like, if it's the most important area, so the safety and safety and, and healthfulness of, you know, chemicals or materials that they're not bad for you. I think there's a preference for that on its own as an indication. But once you get beyond the attributes that's the most important, then it goes to one that's overarching and covers everything. It kind of depends upon, and you kind of have an option to sort of play it both ways. So there's interest in both, and both of them can work, and it doesn't really get the overarching ones. Do you have a lot of support, I guess I would say, really. So thank you for your presentation. It, I think it was really enlightening to see 
how much people in Africa are ahead in with her expectations when it comes to environment compared to Europe, for example. I really would ask you to change your methodology because otherwise you're just optimizing what we have. Yeah? And so it's, it's reduce, reuse, recycle instead of re rethink, reinvent, redesign. And it, like Henry Ford said, if I would ask my customers what they want, they would say horses which run faster. Yeah. So you would stay you always stay in the same paradigm. And nobody asked for the iPhone yeah, from a consumer because they didn't know what that is. So couldn't you change this? Couldn't you ask specifically for cradle to cradle to say, what if we eliminate the idea of waste and make things all nutrition for the biosphere or technosphere? Would you like to see that? Yeah. So because otherwise we are optimizing what we see right now. And this is deadly, and so you make it perfectly deadly because you just optimize what we have right now. Uh, so it's like Albert Einstein said, no problem can be solved with the same type of thinking which causes the problem. So with your uh, research, I think you need to inspire people to think about differently. What if, instead of just a, what, you put, uh, what, what is it what we see right now? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I mean, I definitely agree with you in terms of the, the innovativeness of solutions and that that are, that are needed, and we should have a, almost a blank slate for that. I think what we're looking at here is, is though really more about where consumers are at in terms of their understanding rather than this recommending a particular type of solution or that. We would support what you're saying in terms of being as inventive and creative and systemic and everything else that you should be in terms of the solution that we're finding to, you know, uh, align with those kind of demands and interests that there is in the market. I